to go. Okay. Hi, everybody. Hi. Welcome to our class today. So glad you came out. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. So my name is Doug, and we'll be talking about perennials today. I've been working here at Waters for about six years. I love it. It's great to be here. I'd love to talk about plants. So I thought what we would do today is we're going to talk about perennials. I brought some samples, explain what perennials are, tell you why I think some of these plants are special. And then uh, I want to hear about your questions. I want to hear about your successes, your struggles in the garden, because we all have some of each, I believe, in gardening, especially around here. So we'll ha also have some products I can tell you about and plants. I think the title of the class is something like perennials that do well in the heat. And I picked out some plants that fit into that category. So I'll start out with those. And I'll show you some of these. So this is a crepe myrtle. This is a beautiful, beautiful plant. Oh, that's okay. My my boots are waterproof, so it says, you know. There, this is this is a hot weather plant in that it's not gonna do anything. Shrub. You can get them larger. They don't get really big here. I mean, like trees, but they're, you know, like they could be good sized shrubs. So, um, the thing about crepe myrtle, the thing about Great myrtle is not going to do much of anything as far as flowering until the weather gets hot. So it may leaf out and appear to be ready to go, but until the weather gets up into about the 90s, it really doesn't do very much. But once it gets started, which should be like right about now, they'll flower like this and just be really, really stunning. So it's a bit of a short season compared to other parts of the country, but they are beautiful plants. They have lots of color. I have people who walk past my yard and ask me, what is that beautiful shrub? And I say, oh, it's just my crepe myrtle. I'm very proud of it. So crepe myrtle. So you may be familiar with lantana. Now this lantana is a perennial. There really aren't very many lantanas that will last through the winter here. But this is the same category. It won't do much of anything till the weather gets hot. Now, I also brought up, you may be familiar with, that's a annual lantana. So we have some that can go in the pots, in the yard, on your deck, wherever you want them to be. They're just going to last through the summer. But this lantana, which is called Miss Huff Hardy Lantana, will make it through the winter. And it gets to be pretty big and bushy. It just comes in this one color that you see here. So lantana. I put a lantana in a pot right next to my garage. I think it's the hottest part of the whole yard. And it did better than one that was had been in the ground for three years that was in another spot. So it likes the heat. Full sun. Full heat. Here's another plant that loves the heat. This is Russian sage. Now, there's some Russian sage that gets kind of big. The original version, it gets big. It has it's a little bit invasive. This is a smaller version. This one's called Crazy Blue. So it's a smaller Russian sage that won't overgrow your yard. If you have a smaller space, this is a good choice. If you have a big space and you're looking to fill in space, the regular Russian sage is good. After this becomes established and mature after a few years, it hardly needs any water at all, and it loves the heat. <laughs> So here's another plant that also loves the heat. It's a perennial. 
It's called Red Hot Poker. And you may see these. We have some in our neighborhood, for example, yeah. that they're established, they're up on a mound, just tons of these. One of the things I wanted to mention is that within perennials, there are many different, there are different kinds of perennials. This kind is called herbaceous. So what that means is, as I'm sure you know, perennials, they may die back in the, in the winter time and come back in the spring. Uh, there are also evergreen perennials that don't die back at all. But a herbaceous perennial means this is all going to sort of fall away and you just get these dead branches. There's nothing woody about it. So it's just, it's kind of like an herb. It's sort of a grassy thing. So you got to be careful in the springtime that uh, you don't yank it out thinking it's a weed when it starts to make its comeback. Yes, sir. So I'm going to repeat the questions. The question is, does this plant need to be cut back, this red hot poker? And yes, I would cut back all the shoots that have the flowers. And you don't have to wait till wintertime. If one is finished, you can cut it back. And this can, this can encourage new growth. So as you go, you can prune it. Don't cut back the whole thing. Just go in and snip the flowers. And then you may encourage new flowering growth. So, yes. Okay. I have some of those. I put them in the ground. And after the first flowers died off, no more flowers are coming up. Is that a soil problem? Because I've, I've got it in where it's getting a lot of uh, sunlight. Okay. So the question is, what happens if there's only flowers once and you don't get any new flowers? Well, there's a number of things that could be a possibility. The gentleman asked about the soil. It could be the soil. That's one of the issues about <clears throat> growing anything here is frankly, most of us have pretty crummy soil. That's why we have uh, mulch to amend the soil. So it could be water, it could be fertilizer, it could be soil. Without looking at it, it's hard to say. Now I should tell you also that if you have this plant or any plant for that matter, and something about it doesn't look healthy, you can you should bring in a little cutting because we have a microscope that projects onto a big computer screen and it will help us try and diagnose what's going on. Just talking about it, that's useful, but I'm not sure that I can give you a really intelligent answer. And people come in and they say, look at this picture of my tree. And it, you know, it's about this big and the sun's beating and I can't see anything. A picture is okay. But there's nothing can substitute seeing the real thing. So in conjunction. So bear that in mind, whether it's an old shrub or something you, you get here and it doesn't look appear to be doing well, bring it on in and we can take a look at it. We use that microscope every single day. So as you know, perennials come back every spring or maybe they last through all the winter. This plant right here is called Nandina or heavenly bamboo. It doesn't have any flowers. What it has is green leaves in the summer, red leaves in the winter. It doesn't really have any flowers. It just hangs in there and looks nice. And it's a nice little shrubby plant. I had one of these that uh, was under a snow drift. It was pretty high. And I really couldn't dig it out without breaking the branches. And so it struggled a little bit, but it did come back. So Nandina is an evergreen. So it'll never really lose its leaves in the fall like a deciduous evergreen. So we got our deciduous perennial. So we have per perennials that are evergreens and never lose their leaves and some that drop all their leaves like all of our big trees. Another example uh, of another perennial, and this is called a conifer because it has needles rather than leaves. This doesn't lose its needles in the wintertime either. So one of the things that it's nice that when you're sort of planning your yard and looking at it, is think in terms of having something going on, some color at all different times of the year. Not just have this massive bloom in maybe May or June, and then everything sort of fizzles away for the rest of the summer. So for example, First time in early in the spring, before anything else is flowering, we have forsythias. And then they have these beautiful yellow flowers, and then they're done. And so if you look at the different plants that are flowering at different times of the year, um, and you mix in evergreens, you can have something going on in your yard all the time, which I think is interesting because this isn't just a once and done kind of thing. 
pampas grass, which you may notice is all the way back by the gate. They have these big bushy plants. They come out in the fall, in September. And so when the rest of the yard is kind of fizzling away, you get these tall shoots, these little silky fronds. They're really, they're really beautiful. So this is one type of evergreen. What is that? This is called, sorry, this is a mugo pine. Yes, ma'am. Not very, how tall? The question is how tall does a mugo pine get? I'd say about two or three feet. It really gets more width. And most of them get little cones coming up. This one is a, uh, some of these are dwarfs. But if you notice where these are growing, uh, like in office buildings, around the landscaping around office buildings, that tells me that landscapers know that they won't have to do much in terms of maintenance. It's a plant that they can rely on. They're not going to have to deadhead the roses because there are no flowers here. So mugal pine is a good evergreen choice without making, having something that's a huge tree. And I think it's a little more interesting than, say, um, a juniper. Uh, a little bit, but it's mostly a full sun plant. So that's mugo pine. And I want to show you something else. Oh. Before we continue, um, can we have, um, we get the list and you email folks. What, what are you going to send them? Uh, uh, there'll be several articles about what you're talking about, uh, along with a link to this video if you want to rewatch it. Also is available on YouTube. Did everybody hear that? Okay. So if you sign up for this, if you feel like signing up for this, you'll get some summaries of the class, a link to the YouTube video. That way you can watch the class anytime. Wouldn't that be great? You can just watch me whenever you... A rainy day, right? When you're thinking about gardening. So um, name and email would be great if you're, if you're so inclined. You know? And you won't get any advertisements for plants or fertilizers or whatever. It just... Waters, basically. Also, should mention one thing so many of you here in the class. This only goes out to the people that are here at the class. You get our regular newsletters, you still need to sign up on the sheet to get the handouts. Right. It's just class information is what you're signing up for. Okay. Any questions before I go on to the next the next plant? because I want to show you this plant. This is called Euonymus. Took me a while to learn how to pronounce and spell it, but I think I have it now. And, um, pardon me? <laughs> U, I'm sorry, E-U, E-U-O-N-Y-M-U-S, Euonymus. Now, one of the things about this plant, I always think it's important to spell the names correctly of the plants. Euonymus has about 25 or so varieties. We have some of them here, but almost all of them have variegated color. So this may be more green and less gold variations on that. There's a, kind of a silver edged one. There is a, a Euonymus that's more of a solid green, but this is an evergreen. And this is pretty much what you get all year. In the springtime, they have these little things that are sort of like flowers, but you know, you won't, nobody will confuse them with a rose, but you get this color all the time. So I tell people at my house, Greb knows this because we're neighbors, I have one of these. The gold is really saturated and beautiful. I can see it about half a block away from my home. So I always think if I have a senior moment and I forget where I live, I'm gonna look for this. And that will be my beacon that will, I can find my way home. So. Euonymus is a great plant. Sometimes people put them, plant them in groups and they be, may do a mix and match of different colors. But green leaves all year, not much in the way of maintenance, uh, easy pruning because it's not real woody or thick and it's, it's a great plant. The javelina do not eat the euonymus. Now, <clears throat> that's a really good question. On our website, under Garden Talk, we have one document that lists all the plants that rabbits and deer do not like. Then there's another one. These are plants that javelina don't like. 
And so you can pick and choose. If you have both in your yard, my condolences, because you're going to struggle. Because if you look at it, and I do this sometimes, I'll try and select plants for someone's yard that all of those animals are going to stay away from. And you know what? They're not that many. There's some overlap, maybe 10 or 12. I can tell you in general, when you're selecting plants, and this is included in that, anything that's herbal, lavender, rosemary, sage, no animal is really going to eat those. They don't like them. But, well, that's a whole other story. We have an entire class on gophers and other pests in the yard. It's a real challenge. But if you don't mind, Bev, I, I love to tell the story. Oh, no, no. My neighbor, Bev, had a beautiful raised bed, stone wall. It was full of tulips until one day the javelina came. And, you know, javelina can get on their hind legs like a dog. They can also jump up like a dog. And they ate all of her tulips. And, okay, they ate all the bulbs. They destroyed all the plants. It was a complete mess. But Bev is not, wasn't going to give up that easily. So she had someone come and add some more stones, make it higher. I don't know how you figured out what the reach of a javelina is, but I've seen them jump into my yard from my neighbor's lower yard, and it reminds me of a dog hopping up you know, onto a staircase or whatever. you know. But after adding those, I see that you have new plants there. So... Without me rattling off the list, which is extensive, take a look at that because this is an issue, obviously. Any, anywhere that we garden, you may have javelina, deer, or rabbit, and most likely you will. I mean, some people say there are more animals than people here in Arizona. And I also see pictures on social media of baby javelina, and people talk about how adorable they are until they eat your yard, everything in your yard. Then, then they're not so adorable. Then you realize they're hungry all the time, right? But with selection of the right plants, that can help. Now, as I say, there's a whole class in this issue. And I can just tell you, my yard is kind of like an ancient highway that javelinas have always had. I just happened to build a house there. They still kept the highway. And they'll come through my yard, but I have mostly butterfly bush, lavender, rosemary, plants that they are less likely to, to eat. And that's important. I mean, unless you've got everything fenced in, you need to think about this. So having said that, this is one of the best plants to select, to put in your yard to keep the animals away, the animals that are going to eat them. This is called autumn sage. It's in the big salvia family. We have this in purple flowers and pink flowers. It comes in many different colors. It's a wonderful plant. It flowers all summer. I have one that's this color. And... It attracts hummingbirds. They love it. Sometimes the hummingbirds even come in here and feed. And they, I, we tell them to be on good behavior. Don't get in a fight over food. And then, but you can share the plant. So autumn sage. Um, and it's, this is a perennial, but it's deciduous. So it loses all its leaves, all the flowers in the wintertime. But a quick and easy haircut will help keep it in a sort of a rounded shape. Don't let it get long and leggy or it'll sort of get out of out of control for you after several years. Is that one called hot lips also? Yeah, this one's hot lips, right? And, uh, you know, some plants have kind of cute names, like roses have all kinds of names. Jane Fonda or whatever. Julia Child or whatever. So um, um, there was a plant that a rose somebody bought recently that was called um, Cutie Baby or something like that. And I think the, the, the lady bought it just because she liked the name. I mean, it was a beautiful plant. But anyway, this is a cornerstone basic plant in your yard that animals will stay away from, autumn sage. Can you transplant it easily? I mean, if it starts, because mine are Huge. Okay, so the question was about whether you can transplant this sage. And I'm not sure if you can take cuttings. You can give it a try. But transplanting, in general, is sort of an iffy proposition. It may work. It may not. It, a lot depends on the age of the plant. The older it is, the more of an established root system it's going to have. It's going to be more difficult for you to get it out of the ground. You may decide, for example, you put a plant in, and maybe it's not quite the right place for it, or it doesn't seem to be thriving. If it's a year old, it's not that big a deal. 
But other people say, well, I have to you know, put some pavers here. You're going to get rid of the plant anyway. You don't have anything to lose. But transplanting is not just as easy as pick it up and put it over there. But in your case, if you want to give it a try, you can. You could try the cuttings. Don't know if it's going to work or not. But what do you have to lose? You've got plenty of cuttings. Did you have a question? Yes, ma'am. It's well. We have an more an edible sage, which is a slightly different plant. So I think I would use that. I think that with these other sage plants that are you know ornamental plants, they may not taste as good. Um, they can be kind of tough. Like in the winter time, you know, we have ornamental kale, and people want to eat that. But I think it's um, it's not very good. It doesn't taste very good. To me, kale even. Edible kale doesn't taste very good, but that's just, everybody has their own, you know, taste buds and so on. So, uh, but rosemary, for example, another one in that category of an herbal plant, rosemary grows like crazy. We have a lot over there. Um, and that can go into the recipe. I take cuttings and I throw them on the barbecue if I'm going to be cooking, say, lamb chops or pork chops or whatever. You can get that rosemary smoke. So that works. I think with the sage, uh, the edible sage, you'll probably have a little more success with that. So, yes, ma'am. Would you say in your experience, are hummingbirds much more attracted to the rosemary than the other plants? I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, I hear people say, well, they like the blue, they like the purple. But I, I've seen them come in for all the to all the plants, I think. So the question was whether... Hummingbirds are attracted to one color more than the other. I'm not sure if that's really the case. I think what they're attracted to is the plants that are thriving, that have you know plenty of nectar that they're coming in to eat. Um, but like the um, euonymus, with the sage coming in different colors, you could do a mix and match of that if you wanted to, and you could mix the colors. So any other any other questions? No. What was that going to go to on to? Okay, so we brought some annuals here because we couldn't resist, even though this class is about perennials. We talked a little bit about lantana, and this is, yeah, this is um, an annual lantana, uh, which is wonderful, but it won't make it through the winter like the Miss Huff Hardy lantana. And it comes in several colors. Here's a Here's another plant. I love these hanging plants. This is a you know flowering vinca. Um, it doesn't. It's easy to overwater this, but it loves the sun. And um, but like the other annuals, it'll only make it through the summertime. And we do have a perennial version of vinca. Uh, it's called periwinkle, and you may have seen it. It's a ground cover, kind of a green ground cover. It fills in. It has beautiful little purple flowers. It's evergreen, the perennial. This, you can put it up on your deck. It'll be great all summer. And after several cold nights, maybe in November, it'll all shrivel up and that'll be it for the season. Could you bring Vinca inside? You could, yeah. So the question is, can you bring Vinca inside? You could try um, almost any plant and bring it inside. As long as you get some sunshine, like maybe a window in the garage, it's going to need some sunshine in the winter. You can try outside during the day in winter time, inside at night. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Some people tell me they have success with geraniums doing that. I kind of feel like gardening is enough work already. You know, why why not try and select plants? You don't have to shuttle back and forth because sometimes they get big and they're in big pots and they're kind of difficult to move around. So, any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I have a thinker that I thought reseeded itself, but that's my imagination. Is it the, the, her question was about, does vinca reseed itself? The perennial vinca, the periwinkle, I think it spreads on its own. I think it sends out shoots. I'm not sure if it's reseeding per se. I'm not sure exactly how it spreads, but I can tell you that with vinca, with periwinkle, um, it's a great ground cover, but you, you, cannot let it get out of control where it takes over. I went to visit someone's yard and the vinca had curled around the roses down the below. And I mean, it was choking them out and it was not easy to get in there without getting, having all the thorns. 
So vinca is great to fill in. It's a plant that loves the shade. It's a perennial, it's evergreen. All those things are good attributes, but you gotta be careful because um, it can try and take over. So there's some plants that are like that. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, with what? Not really. Lantana is a full sun plant. Just like the, um, the Miss Huff that I told you about that you would think it would be burning up in front of my garage, it loves it there. I just gotta make sure I water it enough because it's hot and dry there. Yeah, these are also shade sun plants. All Lantana is sun loving. How much water? Well, I, I, you know, I can't, I can't tell you exactly how much water. It's sort of a long answer, and we have a whole class in watering. But if you have something in a pot like these little lantanas, and they're on your front porch and they're getting a lot of sun, I'd water them every day, this time of year, every single day. Don't let it dry out. If you find that when you go back to water again, and the pot is wet, the soil's wet, then back off. Wait till the next day. Just don't let it dry out because pots and plants here, they dry out quickly. That's why we have three full-time people that water plants every single day here. Now I want to show you another plant for unless anybody has any other questions. Actually, I have one from online if you want to take that. Okay, let's take an online question. Marie wants to know, uh, what, is a, uh, what do you recommend as an evergreen perennial for a low hedge? Okay, an evergreen perennial for a low hedge. That's the question from an online viewer. We have, um, for example, Catoniaster is an evergreen. There are some low, small ground cover versions, but there are also some that get to be maybe about a foot tall that will fill out nicely. That would be a good choice. And we have some down there. If you wanna come in here, I'd be happy to show you some of those but that would be a good choice. Full sun, uh, perennial, evergreen, will do well and fill in nicely. Cotoneaster. Think of cotton with one T and the word Easter. All one word, Cotoneaster. Another one that takes a little practice. So I wanna show you another one of, uh, yes ma'am. Okay, the question is, is any part of Cotoneaster poisonous? And the berries might be. But, so the question about what might be toxic for your dogs and cats, or people ask about their horses and so on, we usually tell them that they should check with their vet. We can give you the exact name of the plant, the botanical Latin name. We're not really sure. And what I have found is you look up online, and one source says it's toxic to cats, and the other one says it isn't. So I'm not really sure what to believe. But I, you know, I trust my vet as to what's good or not good for my pet. So that's how we approach that. You know. Yeah, sometimes those berries are not good for animals. Birds may eat them, and they're, they're, they're doing great. But other animals, may be a different story. So I know we're talking about perennials. This is an annual. Isn't this beautiful? I love this plant. I ha this is called Portulaca. And it's basically like a succulent. And it grows in flowers all summer. And in the evening, a lot of times the leaves close up and they look like they're gone. So I have a kind of an a active cat. That would be a nice way of describing him. And sometimes he eats my plants. And so I thought he was eating these flowers. Until, and then that they'd come back the next day when the sun came out. So what I learned is that just leave him alone because sometimes when he sticks his head into a plant, he comes back out with a grasshopper. So that's a good thing. But these, and then these lasted pretty long. I think mine died back in November. But for a beautiful annual that flowers and is a succulent, this is a great choice. There aren't that many succulents that will survive our winters. So you have to kind of, uh, be able to enjoy them in the summertime. Portulaca. Uh, I think so. 
I mean, I think deer and rabbit will like it. Again, we've got to look at that list. It's got dozens of plants there. Mine is on a deck, so it's a protected area. By the way, I will include that with the handouts. And for those online, I've already posted the link to both the javelina and the deer. Good, so okay. So you'll get that list. You should have that with you. You should look at that before you come in here so you can get an idea. I like this plant. Yes, it's on the list, which means they may not eat it or you know, they're, they're likely to eat it uh, because it's, it's hard to memorize all of them, but you'll hit a link to those lists that I mentioned. Yes, ma'am. Yes, Portalaka needs sun. Yes, ma'am. When? Okay, so the request was to talk about wind. What can we say about the wind? It blows hard every day. Plants do not like that. It's very, it dehydrates the plants in a big way. And here it blows over any tree that isn't tied down. And so we always say the month of June, as we know, it's hot, dry, windy, and almost no humidity not a good environment for plants. So if you have new plants or even existing ones, the goal is to just hang on. Hang on through the month of June because if the rains come, the plants are gonna love it. Because you know we can water our plants every day, but we cannot provide them with humidity. And so a lot of plants, like a lot of the veggies here, which struggle in June, it starts raining and they have humidity, all of a sudden they just kind of blossom. You know, some of them are, are tropical plants. And so that's the environment that they like. That's not the environment that we live in. So sun is difficult. I mean, the wind. Wind is difficult in addition to the sun. So you may need to maybe add more water to your watering schedule. Watch them, you know, put your finger in the pot to get an idea of the soil. On the ground, you know, the soil should be uh, dry for maybe a couple inches before you water again. Again, then we had a whole other class on watering and the guidelines and so on. But yeah, June is a tough month. You would think it's wonderful, not if you're a plant. So, um, so one of the other things is we have trees, obviously. Over there, we have lots of beautiful deciduous trees, maples, ash, uh, aspens, fruiting, non-fruiting pear trees, non-fruiting plums. They're all good trees. We only bring trees and shrubs here that we know are going to do well in this climate, and they have plenty of cold hardiness. So uh, when you look at the tag, uh, it'll usually tell you that it's good to zero to 10 degrees, or usually lower than that. So that's a good guide that everything is going to be okay. Now I want to show you another tree. Can you see this okay, Ken? This is a desert willow, and it's a native tree. What I like about it is, see the flowers? Not very many trees flower in the summer. This tree will flower all summer long. And I've seen some of these in empty lots where I don't think anybody's taking care of them. They seem to be doing well. So just because it has that sort of wild desert Southwest look and because and because it flowers all summer, it's really one of my favorites. So it's a desert willow. Comes in a couple different colors, but most of them are in this pink and purple. How yes. big does it get? Desert willow get, can get to be uh, maybe 15 feet tall, 10 feet wide, somewhere in that neighborhood. I've seen some a little bit bigger, but that's probably a typical average size. Do you have some that have pods and some that don't? They, no, we don't. The question is about pods. And we usually have the type that don't have pods. Let me elaborate on that. Let me go on before I get to your question. So here's the deal. A lot of people are concerned that trees are messy, that they have pods and they have seeds and they have stuff that they drop. So we try and bring in trees that don't have that issue, right? So for example, the um, ornamental pear trees they get these little round things that 
you know, nobody would confuse them with a pear, but people will look at that or like crab apples. They, oh, it's going to spill. It's going to be all messy. It's not like fruit that gets ripe and juicy. So most of these things, if the birds don't eat them, they just dry up. They may fall on the ground. So pods and that sort of messiness, we generally stay away from that. Trees have been hybridized to not be messy trees. And are they as hardy? Yes. Okay. Yes, they're equally as hardy. Just a question on the root system. Uh, is it very evasive? Goes out all over the place? Uh, on this tree? Yes. No, this is not particularly invasive. The question was asking about the roots on this tree. Is it invasive? Is it going to get into your septic tank? Is it going to you know, damage your house? The answer is no. But... A good rule of thumb is if you're going to plant a tree, it should be at least 10 feet away from your house, maybe 15. Too close to the house, not a good idea because maybe the roots can get into your foundation and the branches are probably going to grow into your window. So you don't need it to be that close to provide some shade for you. So when you're selecting a spot to put a tree, bear that in mind. The trees, uh, like up in Sedona, you know, you see these cottonwood trees that are down by Oak Creek and the roots are popping up. That's usually because they're growing in the lawn, but they water every day for five minutes. So there's no deep root watering, which is what trees need, so that the roots come up to the surface. And what happens is we as visitors get to walk on that and trip over it, and it's not very attractive. And I think the two are not, so there's an example of a tree not really being in a good place, because if you're either you have a lawn over here, you have a tree over there, sometimes they don't always mix. For example, this lady came in and had a clump of aspens in the middle of her lawn. And she said, well, the aspens get the water that I give to the lawn, which is like 10 minutes every day. So you know what happens is, you know how aspens can send little suckers out all over the place? Well, they're doing that because there's so much water and they love it. She told me that she spent three hours cutting suckers out of her lawn. And I thought about it, I have three clumps of aspens and in 14 years that I lived there, I haven't spent combined three hours pulling suckers out. Yeah, they pop up sometimes, but not three hours in the springtime. So, um, okay, another question. Do you know if APS is still offering the rebate for planting shade trees? I don't know about that. So the question is, is APS still offering a rebate for planting shade trees? I think it's like $15 a tree or something. Don't know about that. But if you're interested in shade trees, I can show you some after the class. We have some great shade trees over there. We also have um, blue spruces um, and a lot of other conifers, evergreens, which leads me to the next tree I want to show you over here. So this is this. Before you get started, yeah. I, I just Googled to see. Uh, as of February, there was some sort of a program where they were providing free trees to certain communities. So Everybody hear Ken's answer? Ken looked up the question about APS offering rebates on trees. He just looked it up and said APS is still offering some rebates in some communities. So you may have to, you know, look that up yourself. But um, if that works out, as I say, we got lots of great shade trees that will provide shade for your house, the patio, whatever you want. Now, this is an Arizona cypress. So it's an evergreen tree um, and it's got this blue green look. It has, this is not, when people come in and they want a Christmas tree, which really means they want a blue spruce, you know, this is not the tree we showed them right? Because this is anything but a Christmas tree shape. It's kind of asymmetrical. It's all over the place. That's why I like it. I think it's great. And, you know, this can provide a lot of shade and privacy. Um, I've seen one that's like near a hot tub and it blocks out the sun so you don't get too hot. Um, it's a great native tree and, and does really well here. So Arizona cypress. We have a lot of them. We have some over there next to the blue spruces. After the class, I'd be happy to show you some of our trees if you're interested, or at least point you in the direction.
Okay, so I want to change gears a little bit and talk a bit about products. Before we leave plants for a moment, does anybody have any other any other questions about plants we've talked about? Yes, ma'am. Not that you've talked about, but I had two great big pots on my deck. And it's the on the second level. Um, potatoes and um, Cabri... Cabri Coca. And they were thriving. I was using the bloom stuff on them, and they were terrific. And in a matter of a week, maybe a week and a half, and they were just thousands of flowers on them, something came in and just ate the flowers. There were little holes in them. I searched for bugs. I sprayed, and something ate all of the flowers. But the plants are thriving. Is it a bird? Okay, did everybody hear that question? She had some nice uh, annuals with flowering, petunias and calibricola, it sounds like. And they were doing really well on the deck until one day they weren't because something came along. So what is that? I don't know. I have to look at a photo or look at a cutting. Back to the cutting, you know, people come in and say, look at this, what's wrong with this? Um, or they don't have a sample. Yeah, the plant is fine. Yeah. They look great. So, Okay, so let me try and answer that question. I understand. Let me try and answer that question. There are oftentimes in the summer, you get these little bud worms. They love geraniums. You see them crawling along. They, they get into the buds and they, they probably get into them and prevent them from opening. So bud worms. So we do have a spray, which I'm gonna to get to sprays in just a moment. I understand that happens. That's just another part of gardening is we got bugs. Our roses have aphids and thrips. There's a lot of stuff that are can be a real challenge. And this time of year, they're doing great, they're hungry, and they're reproducing like crazy. Now let me get to insecticides in, in a minute. I wanna mention that this is an all-purpose fertilizer that we have. This is something that you should use on everything in your yard three times a year. It's a light granular product. It just I just throw it in the ground and I water it in so it doesn't blow away and it does really well. And it's not, uh, it's not chemical, it's a slow release product. That's one of the good things about it. And um, I've been using this on my trees for years and they're doing really well. So 744, it's a great all purpose fertilizer. What I like is you can do the whole yard all at the same time. Um, Now, this is another product that's called Root and Grow. This is a liquid fertilizer. It's this thick, brown, fertile, funky stuff. And, um, but it's, you don't have to wait for three months. This is something that if you can, uh, uh, yeah. So they probably know I have sage over here. I right? said, so looking for it. Um, this is a good liquid fertilizer. We often recommend people when they plant something new, it helps with transplant shock. It helps stimulate root growth. I put it on plants that maybe look like they're a little bit stressed. Maybe they got some bugs or the weather was rough. You remember when we had those two cold snaps a little while ago, some plants struggled. And I cut back a lot of shrubs. I cut back the new growth that had been affected by the cold. And we hit them with this, root and grow. So you just mix it with water um, and it, you can do it every couple weeks as opposed to the regular fertilizer, which is more once every three months or so. So root and grow. Now this, this is uh, our, our best insecticide. It's called Sayonara. So it's like Sayonara to all those bugs that are eating your plants. This is a concentrate. So you pour it into your sprayer and turn it on and hose everything. It's good for the aphids that may get onto your flowering shrubs like roses. It's good for pretty much anything. Um, I think it may also be good for grasshoppers, except sometimes your grasshoppers fly away. But um, this is a good product and you could try this on your flowers and see if it kills those worms. Yes. Can I make a point? Yes. Uh, grasshoppers, usually no obate is the suggested treatment. The company that produces no obate could not get any supply this year. 
So we are recommending the Sayonara as an alternative to the Noro version. Now, having said that, there are some restrictions using the Sayonara that you need to be aware of regarding pets and things like that. Okay. Noro bait was basically just an organic virus that never got transmitted to anything but grasshoppers. But this does have some restrictions. And the other product, can everybody hear that, that this is good for grasshoppers? You just need to read the label, be sure you're aware of the uh, restrictions and conditions and so on. But we have, Nolobate is a wonderful product that kills grasshoppers and it's organic. But as Ken said, at factory in Colorado, which had a fire a few years ago, they've been in trouble having difficulty producing product. And so the other substitute that we have for grasshoppers is what is it called, Ken? Um, the grasshopper substitute is, that's really it. but the powdery stuff that's in bag that you mentioned to me the other day. Um, oh, uh, turf ranger. Turf ranger. So turf ranger is an alternative to nolo bait, and because when you're spraying, you turn on the spray, what happens? The grasshoppers all fly away. This is a contact spray, so you want the bugs to be there. Turf ranger like Nolo bait is something that you set out, and they, like maybe on the edge of your yard, and you want to encourage the grasshoppers to eat that. And then it's, it, it gives them a virus. So they start to not feel very well, and they get a little sick, and then the other grasshoppers eat them, and they get it. And then if, they, if, the, if it's a you know, mom with babies, the eggs get it. So slowly you can do away with this. Now that takes a while. And some people say, well, look, the grasshoppers are eating everything in my yard right now. I saw a so, <laughs> so grasshoppers are even yeah. conscious about COVID. How, how nice. <laughs> but, you know, if they eat our plants, I don't care, right? I'm still ready to get rid of them. And as I mentioned, I, I can, my cat is available to rent <laughs> and he likes grasshoppers. But, uh, but, any, any questions? Any other? Yes, yes sir. Is Sayonara effective against the worms that uh, eat my apples? Yes. Oh. Yeah. That would be good. Yeah. Now, you know, for those gypsy moths for apples, that's a whole other story where, you know, you put a little net out there. You notice on orchards, the question was about um, worms that get into our apples and kind of destroy them. It's not very appealing to open it up and there are all these holes in there. Gypsy moths can be a real problem for apples. And if you notice on orchards, they have these little tents that tells us, tells the farmer when it's time to apply the spray because in the little tent, they've caught the moths. I'm not sure if we have that. Now, a lot of things are difficult to get a hold of nowadays, like anything else. My neighbor took them nine months to get a Ford truck. It used to be, when you went to the deal, they'd want you to drive off that day in the car. But it took him nine months to get a Ford. Anyway, this is what we currently have. We also have another product that's called, um, well, it has neem oil in it. It's called Triple Action. That is also something you might consider the neem oil, uh, which is the major ingredient in this product. It kind of smothers the bugs. You want to be careful about not having that oil on a real hot day because it can beat up. So early morning and evening application. But Triple Action is another alternative for bugs. Sometimes people use that, doesn't completely get rid of it, then we move them up to this. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Any of these things will kill ladybugs, praying mantis, butterflies, anything that goes in there. Anything, if you see butterflies or bees on your plant, I would not spray. Maybe you wait till later in the day because, yes, this is a broad spectrum kind of thing, it's not selective. Usually not. Usually if it dries, then it's okay for them. But you never know. It could be in the fabric. But, you know, this is a thing. It's, not, it's hard to find something that's going to kill these undesirable bugs, but save, not harm the ladybugs, the butterflies, etc. that's also around your plant. Yes. So the question is, is this product going to be harmful to the birds? It might be. I think probably not because what are the birds eating? Are they eating the flower? Are they eating the leaf? Not really sure. 
of eating the bugs? I don't know. What's the what is the question? Yes, it's possible that there could be that transference. So a bug that has this may be difficult, to, for, dangerous for the birds. On the other hand, I think they die pretty quickly. So it's not going to be alive and uh, a lot of them out there for the birds to eat. Um, I have a question. Uh, I have, I think, aphids on my iris, and mm -hmm. I sprayed them with neem oil, and it kind of killed my, my flowers and everything. Maybe I should have used cyanide. Perhaps. And it could be that the oil, if it was in the heat of the day, you know, might have burned up the iris. Now that there are no more flowers, the question was about she had um, used the triple action, the neem oil on her iris, and it seemed to damage the flowers. Um, there are no flowers on the iris now, obviously. But do you, do you still have aphids there? Um, I don't think so. I cut away all those. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, these things, I mean, these products, um, some people say, well, I'd rather use grandma's recipe of vinegar and dish soap. And if that works for you, great. You know, some people say I've tried it many times and it's not really helping. But other people swear by it. What point about what you said about cutting the stuff back? It's usually suggested that once you spray a week or two after, you spray it again. In that case, the stuff is back, back on there somehow. You, you then kill that. Uh, the cyanara or the new oil? Uh, well, in particular, the cyanara. Okay, for example, I had agents on my honeysuckle. Okay, sprayed a couple of weeks ago, this week I'm going to spray it again. And it's made a huge difference in terms of how the is coming back. So did everybody hear that? What Ken was saying is basically it may take multiple applications of the insecticide to get rid of them. You might kill a batch of them if you survive, and then they reproduce, and all of a sudden you got a new crop of bugs. That can happen. There are a lot of them around, and they're really hungry. Yes, ma'am. Uh, is this a good time to be fertilizing with the conditions we have this month, like all my non-flowering things? And my flowering. So the question is about whether this is a good time to fertilize. And the answer is yes, because pretty soon, if we're lucky, it'll start raining. So you want that fertilizer to be on the ground and get washed in. So the thing about our all-purpose fertilizer is that it's almost impossible to put too much on it. There's nothing chemical in there. It's not going to burn anything. It's made up mostly of um, cottonseed meal and bird droppings. So it's something that's safe for the plants. So if you drop some like on your lawn, you're not gonna have this giant green patch there. Um, so it's good because it's good to get it in the ground and then the rain can start to wash it into the ground. So this is a good time. In fact, our, our suggested calendar for fertilizing, we use you know, dates, times of the year we can remember, Easter, 4th of July, um, Halloween and New Year's Day something along those lines, those four times of the year, that gives you sort of a continuous flow of fertilizer and food going into the plant. Say that again, please. Fourth of July. Easter, Fourth of July, Halloween, New Year's Day. So those are good times. And this all-purpose fertilizer that I'm talking about, um, there's, if you want to be precise, there's um, information about how many ounces to apply based on the thickness of the trunk of your tree? I looked at that and said, forget this. I'm not here to do mathematics in my garage. And so I have a bucket of the fertilizer and I walk around. If you're a big tree, I'm going to give you four handfuls. If you're a shrub, I'll give you three. So I use my own unscientific method to get the fertilizer to the plants. And you know what? It works because my plants are healthy. And to say, it's not chemical, it's really difficult to overdo it. And, and it's just easy to apply. Just water it in afterwards. You don't have to till it in the ground, but you don't want it to wash away or blow away in, in the wonderful wind that we have all the time. Yes, ma'am. I went to the Alta Vista Garden Tour a couple weekends ago, and one lady had just an amazing group of flowers, and absolutely everyone said, what are you doing? She finally had to go get her big bag of water's all-purpose fertilizer. <laughs> Thank you. Show it to everybody. <laughs> everybody hear that? I love commercials like that, you know. At the garden tour, which goes to some beautiful gardens, um, 
this lady came out and said, here's what I use. It's what we use. It's what I use. It's just all purpose. I, I think it's better than other chemical products because it's slow release. It's not damaging to the plants or anything. Even if you put it on the ground, watered it in, and it, maybe your dog might sniff or lick it a little bit, that's okay. Just don't let your dog feed at the bag because too much is too much. There can be too much, right? So I, but I avoid that by just, I use the whole bag all at once. Then I'm good for three months. And I don't even keep any around because I've got the liquid fertilizer. Yeah. So one last product I want to tell you about. This is called tree and shrub drench. You may have used this. Um, it was called plant protector. Uh, we don't carry that anymore, but this is the same ingredients. So if you have ponderosa pines, pinyon pines, even deciduous trees, this is a once a year drench application that is systemic, goes down into the roots, comes up into the trees, and helps uh, with the pinyon pines and the ponderosas, it helps with the bark beetles. Now, if your pinyon pine is completely infested with the bark beetles, it probably won't help, but it's a good preventative thing. I use this because my pears used to get thrips. Really difficult to isolate thrips, they're so small. But, so I use this every day, every year, once a year, and I just drench all the trees. Pretty easy, mix it with water, pour it on the ground. No spraying, that kind of thing. So, what time well, it doesn't matter. I do it in the spring before the bugs come along, right? So late spring is good. Um, you could do it in the winter, uh, but I think it's better, you know, before the bugs come along. So, how many trees will that take care of? Okay, so the question is how many trees? So, it's, there's no simple answer to that because the amount of product that you use with, in relationship to water is based on the thickness of the trunk. So the bigger the tree, the more product you use. I have 11 deciduous trees. I think I used three containers. But you know, I'm not, I'm not out there spraying bugs on my trees, that kind of thing. It's good for the whole year. Now, Ken was nice enough to bring up one other product that I want to tell you about. So this time of year, um, most of our plants are flowering. We want to keep them flowering. So I use flower power. This is light granular stuff. You mix it up with water. Every two weeks, you just pour it on your plant. And I put this on my roses and my shrubs. My crepe myrtles are just starting to flower. I want to encourage them to flower more. So I give them flower power. This is high in nitrogen. This product, this whole goal in life is to promote flower. So this is a good thing to have and you could, you know, there's a lot in here, but you know, with between flowers and shrubs, roses, whatever, you can use this all season. So it's a good product. Yes. What potted plants? Yes. In fact, so the question was, can you use the flower power on potted plants? The answer is yes. And the way I use it is I'll mix up two gallons because there's one scoop per gallon. There's a little scoop in the container. One scoop per gallon, I have a two-gallon watering can. Usually, I can water all my potted plants on my deck with maybe four gallons of that. So I mix it up twice, give them all a lot of water. That's the watering they get for that day. They're also getting some fertilizer so that they grow. Um, any other questions? Yes. You're getting a lot of help from online. <laughs> and Maureen reminded us that flower power is also great for vegetables. Ah, okay. Tomatoes. Okay. So we know, you know, flower power is good for vegetables as well. Tomatoes, peppers, a lot of those, you know, eggplants, they have flowers also. So it's kind of giving them a lot of nitrogen. Um, any other questions? I think we're kind of at the end of the presentation, so we're open to more questions if anybody has any. Where'd it go? So, yes, ma'am.
No, Russians, Russian sage, the question was about Russian sage, it's deciduous. So it's going to drop all its flowers and you get these little dry branches. You can cut those back in the winter. Um, that's what we do. Most people cut their Russian sage way back in the wintertime and it'll come back again in the springtime. You can count on that. Um, so, yes, sir. You have two fertilizers up there. One you said that you could put on everything to be able Yes. Is there enough difference between the flower the fertilizer and the other fertilizer that you should keep them separate and only use the flower power on flower? Or could you use the regular? Okay, so the question is about the fertilizer. And we actually have three you know, since we've added the flower power. The question is, you keep them separate, you do them differently at different times? The answer is really no, it doesn't really matter. Um, the flower power, I mean, its primary idea of goal in life is to promote flower. So you would, probably wouldn't use that in the winter when you're not getting any flowers, right? But you can use that every week. The root and grow is, you know, kind of a um, composted tea product. You can pour in there. It'll help with flowers as well, but it also pr promotes growth, root growth, and so on. And then the all-purpose fertilizer is kind of like the good uh, three times, three or four times a year for everything in the yard, all-purpose. Yes, ma'am. Is one or the other better for my iris? Because they, I think they need phosphorus, I think. They like high phosphorus. You could probably use the um, all-purpose because, after all, the irises now, they're the, the, and the peonies, they're sort of... They're not all necessarily flowering any longer, so there's no point in doing that. But you want you want the phosphorus and other elements in there, so when the irises are ready, like next April, yes. they've got something there to feed them. So, uh, yes, ma'am. So the question is about bulbs in general, when they start to fade in the heat, can you cut them back? And yes, you should, but I would wait a little bit till most more of the green goes away. You want some of the green to go back into the rhizome. So fall, I think, is a good time to cut back the iris. So you can cut them back short and you can pull out all the brown leaves. And fall is a good time to do that. And then you can determine it's also a good time to separate them because as you probably know, irises, um, and they are perennials after all, so they're in what we're talking about today. Irises need to be separated about every three years or so. So there's a whole handout under this um, garden talk that you're going to get, a whole handout on how to deal with irises. You take them out of the ground, you separate them, you break them off, you throw away a lot of the old rhizome. So it looks like a, like a long, skinny sweet potato, basically. But you can take those and just sort of cut them apart, put them back in the ground, and then they'll flower more. When your irises get to the point where they're not really flowering much anymore, that's probably because they need to be separated. And that could be every three years or so. And by the way, there's a, um, I, yeah, yeah, committee roots. There's an Irish Society, Prescott Irish Society. You might look at their website. Uh, they might have directions on how to do that, or if you want to, buy more rhizomes, you can. But at like 10 bucks a rhizome, I'm not sure I wanna spend them a kind of money when I have more irises than I know what to do with, right? So, <laughs> but yeah, irises are there, they're hardy. Usually animals, leave them alone. They'll eat the tulips, but they've never bothered my iris. Who knows why? Maybe they're a little drier, you know, but um, that's a good question about um, maintenance. And I think, you know, irises are wonderful, April and May, this year was a really good year for irises. If you have them in your yard, they did great. And unlike some years, there was no hailstorm that came along and, and shredded the flowers. But they look kind of a little tired now, And but it's good to think about either clean them up or clean them up and separate them. October is a good time to do that. So, yes, ma'am. This one? Yeah. Yeah, we I didn't talk about the Indiana. I think I did. Okay, but thank you about the butterfly bush. So
Butterfly bush. Here's a great perennial plant that loves the heat, will flower all summer, and is also in this category of semi-evergreen. So it may lose some of its leaves, but hang on to others. It kind of depends on what sort of winter we have. If we have a lot of storms and cold weather, it may drop more. But usually when I prune my butterfly bush in the winter, they uh, still have a lot of leaves on them, and they've got all these flowers. And this particular variety, the reason I brought this up is this is a dwarf butterfly bush. It's called a pugster. And I have a little white pugster in my yard. You may have noticed the little white one by the mailbox there just down the street. It is flowering like crazy. Butterfly bushes, the, some of them can get really big and leggy. And now we've come out in others that are a little bit smaller. Puckster is only going to get to be two by three wide and tall, which is good because I put it in a spot where there isn't a whole lot of room. I don't want to get in the way of the lady that delivers the mail. But butterfly bush are good. Uh, animals don't like them except butterflies, of course. Um, so thank you for reminding me. I, did I miss anything else here? I, and I can I can just smell the fragrance here. It's wonderful. Kind of reminds me of your lilacs. Right? <laughs> it has that kind of lilac smell. Um, but uh, I think that's it for the class. If you don't have any other questions, uh, thank you for coming out today. Um, uh, I should tell you one other thing. Um, we we do have a, a service, this is sort of tooting my own horn, you might say, but we have a service where I can come out to your yard and advise you about landscaping, um, and talk about things. It's not like a big uh, schematic that you might get from a landscaping company. It's more like a brainstorming thing. You come out and, and I suggest some ideas. You come back and shop here. If you're interested, I give you the details about that, what it costs, what it entails, and what it isn't. It's a garden consultation, a whole different story, but that's available if you're interested. But thank you so much for coming out, and uh, I hope you enjoy this. I thought it was a lot of fun. Uh, I like talking about plants, and uh, enjoy your questions because they're always thought-provoking, and we want to make this about what you're wondering about. So thanks a lot. <laughs>